Lots of sun. Does that include grasses? Does that include grasses? No, it doesn't. Grasses? Grass. Grass. I'm sorry? Grass. Rest. Um, for, for different species, it probably does, yeah. Or a ponderosa pine, it definitely does. <clears throat> How would ponderosa do in a climate where it never freezes? Ponderosa pine in a climate where it never freezes would eventually uh, exhaust its resources and slowly lose health and die. It will. Yes. However, however, you take a ponderosa pine, you have this fantastic contorted trunk, and you say, oh my gosh, they're so great, and I'll never be able to afford uh, an imported tree that looks like that. Right? You can graft over ponderosa pine. Most people don't realize pines can be grafted onto pines, junipers can be grafted onto junipers. You can change out the foliage of a ponderosa pine. And interestingly enough, if you change out the foliage of a ponderosa pine with the foliage of another type of pine, it will absolutely take on the characteristics of that pine to some extent. Right? Mm -hmm. You can never duplicate the strength of a Japanese black pine, but you can, you can enable a ponderosa pine to survive in a warmer climate. So you could actually graft kuromatsu to it and take it way out of its photo period? You could graft black pine to it and you could take it anywhere that black pine is capable of growing. Well, isn't photosynthesis what dictates photosynthesis in the needle type what dictates respiration and the creation of resources in a tree? So it makes sense that if the characteristics of that needle type that dictate respiration and the utilization of of resources. If you change that, it would naturally take on the characteristic of the thing that's generating that energy and that's utilizing that energy. Absolutely. Yeah, so if you took a, a grafted over ponderosa pine and you put it, or uh, a, a grafted over ponderosa pine of black pine and you put it in a really cold environment, black pine don't like extreme cold, right? They can tolerate cold, they can't to uh, tolerate extreme cold. It would die. It would die in a place where a ponderosa pine could thrive. Well, another thing that uh, it sneaks up on people, the, my, the mycorrhizae that grow on black pines are generally not hard, hardy in the, high, on the, in the colder climates either. So you're dead from the top and you're dead from the bottom. I guess that it depends on if black pine really, really depend on mycorrhizae to grow successfully. If they don't, it helps, but they don't. That doesn't, that's not a prerequisite to, to help and success. So, when you style a tree, uh, sometimes you've got to sacrifice the fact that ultimately I don't want to reduce the foliage mass, right? I don't want to reduce the foliage mass, but in order to style this and to make this look attractive and to get this tree headed in the right direction in terms of establishing a good solid structure, I have to reduce some of the needle mass for the health of the interior buds for the position of the branching and the styling, um, for the presentation for you guys, for the presentation for me, for the presentation of this tree, right? I want this tree to feel sexy. I want it to love, love sitting here and showing off for you guys. And so I remove a lot of the needles that are unattractive and the older needles come off naturally because this is the time of year for them to fall off anyways. <clears throat> but, but, you will see a slight in the needle elongation on this tree as a result of me plucking some of the needles still, even now. The needles on ponderosa pines elongate all the way till fall, and you will see um, slightly longer needles next year. Right? The year after that, you're going to see significant reduction in needles. What would be the aftercare of the tree? For this? Yes. Nothing. This kind of work is this is not not severe for a ponderosa pine. Let's put it right back in full sun. Put it right back in full sun. You have to put it back in full sun. Outside of excessive, excessive, excessive heat, this tree should be absolutely put back in full sun. Can you comment on what kind of pot this is going to go into for the next phase? Um, let me finish the design and then I'll talk about it. Okay. Now you have to stick around. <laughs> <laughs> what about your needlework, your uh, bud trimming and such? Bud those? trimming. Bud trimming. Never bud trim a ponderosa pine. Um, there's a lot of people that 
there are theories out there, right? In the fall, in August, late August, right about now, you take a ponderosa pine, you strip it of foliage, you pluck off all of the new buds for next year, and it'll bud back profusely. My experience has been the best way to get bud back on a ponderosa pine is increase the amount of resources moving through the branches. That way you don't compromise the health of the tree, and you're working with the tree to generate some momentum and, and uh, significant positive energy flow towards getting this tree where you want it to go. So my needlework, or any work for that matter on a ponderosa pine, is more geared towards getting the tree to where it needs to go with the strength that it needs to have to get there, as opposed to trying to force it, right? And it's the same with junipers. We have this idea that we've got to push trees, that we've got to force trees to do what we want. That's working, that's like, um, I was working with this designer uh, to develop a presentation for the Japanese gardens in Portland. Mike Hagedorn and I are trying to start a show in Portland in 2013 and, and uh, we want it to be at the Japanese gardens and they needed a big fancy presentation to sell some of the people on the board that make the decisions. And so I was working with this designer and we were talking about business and everything in general and I was telling her that it was kind of tough to make a living as a bonsai professional and she said, why? And I said, well, you got this and this and this and right and it's not that easy and she said, okay. She said, do you ever realize that you're like the rock in the river and not the water? And I said, no, I didn't realize that. And she said, you're the one that everything's crashing against and moving around. And I thought, huh. But then if you take that and you transfer that to bonsai, if you take a bonsai and you try to get this bonsai to be what you want it to be and do what you want it to do, you are officially, you're officially being the rock in this bonsai's life. Okay. That it's having to crash against and move around. And if you can work together with this tree to develop something without compensating or having to uh, force this tree to adjust itself for you, um, you're working at a better pace with a, a, a higher, higher aspiration in mind than people who are trying to get this tree, force this tree to do what they want it to do. Is this the initial that you're doing? Is this like the beginning of the vision, the idea that a couple of years from now it will actually mature to where you today Absolutely, absolutely. So that's a great question. When, when we style a tree, a lot of people think, okay, we style this tree and then we want it to stay just like this. And this is kind of, I kind of sound like a broken record, but you guys are going to have to deal with me for the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes. But, right, I want to keep it just like this. I love it. It's so cute. It's so adorable or it's so cool or whatever you think it is. Okay. And so we try not to let it grow. But when you style a bonsai, you should be considering everything that's going to happen three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 50 years down the road. The best people are thinking 50 years down the road. If I do this now, what's going to happen to this portion of the tree? How is this going to react? What, are, what is the potential repercussion in the future for everything that I'm deciding now? So this styling, I'm thinking about what I want this tree to look like in, I generally try to think 10 to 15 years down the road. And that takes a little bit of experience to know how this tree is going to develop and have an idea of what it's going to look like. But if you can consider the fundamental principles that dictate a good design, and if you have the chance to work on some, of, some older trees, which I think is very unique to people that have studied in Japan, and probably why people still find our knowledge to be of value to you, if you have the opportunity to do that and to see how trees react and what happens to trees that have been worked on um, 30, 50, 60, 80, 100 years ago, and how those design um, ideas affected the development of the tree, um, when you design trees, you can consider that with a lot more realistic comprehension of what you're doing. But absolutely considering the future in mind when I'm designing this tree. This is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. And I can tell you there's a third of these branches that the next time this tree is worked will come off. So we used to, we used to wire Zuisha white pines a lot. I don't know if you guys know what Zuisha white pines are, if you've ever seen them or if you've ever worked on them. Very, very vigorous, short needle um, variety of, of Japanese white pine. And they're terrible. They're terrible to work with. And I probably say that because we worked on a billion of them. We even had so many of them that they had to generate a show so that they could develop a demand for them and make them more acceptable. Right? But nobody wanted them. Like Zuisha white pine, it's like you, you wire it one day, you got to unwire it the next because they grow so vigorously. Right? So vigorously. Anyways. These trees, we used to get these as raw stumps or field-grown material. And uh, uh, the initial styling of them, inevitably, Mr. Kimura would leave excessive amounts of branches, and I never, never understood it. 
why would he leave so much? There's already so much there, or it's never going to need that branch. And his, his um, justification for that, one time he got fed up with me. I didn't ask. You never just asked, like, why would you do that? But he always wondered. And he knew when you were wondering. And so one day he kind of got fed up with me wondering. And uh, he said, you have to do this because this is how you develop a tree. This is how you maintain the tree's energy. And he would say, next time that this tree is styled, this comes off, this comes off, this branch goes here, this goes here, this is going to come in here, this is going to be reduced, and this is going to be longer. And I was like, well, you know, and then he's like, in five years, this is coming off. In 10 years, if this branch develops like this, this apex is going to come here. We're going to have to bend the trunk here, and we're going to have to readjust this. And I was like, off the top of his head. And it was just like, wow, that's the kind of consideration that somebody that's styling a tree with true efficiency, true fluency, and, and really, really adept ability is considering. Hmm. Now, while you're talking about Zuisha, uh, I know that they're raised from cuttings a lot, but uh, also grafts, and I'm uh, hearing that you cannot graft, that you, you must graft them on black pines, and I'm told if you graft them on black pines, they're dead ten years down the road. Hmm. Uh, who's right? I guess it depends on how yeah. There's no, I can't see any reason why you shouldn't be able to. Inevitably, if you graft outside of white pines, if you graft uh, outside of Miyajima white pines, which are, are very typically grafted on black pines, and some Shikoku pines, but um, Kokonoe is another common variety that was grafted onto Japanese black pine, and inevitably the graft will fail. And Zuisha white pine now has such a strong root system on its own. The only reason you would graft it to black pine is because the root system is weak. And Zuisha white pine root system is not weak. And so what they're finding now is that it's better on its own root system than it, is, than it is on the black pine root system. What happens is it's so vigorous, it outgrows the graft. It outgrows the graft union. So the portion that's attached to the graft union starts to grow faster than the portion of the tree that was above the graft union, right? Because there's only one spot where the cambial layers line up. Okay, the outer portion of that never actually heals, right? I mean, it closes up, it starts to develop bark, you can't see it anymore. However, there's one part that's always going to grow faster. As that grows faster, one part grows slower, you start to get a tree that shifts and changes. Mm -hmm. And at some point, that graft, become, that graft union dislocates, mm -hmm. separates. Coconoe is the same. Coconoe is the epitome of that problem. Okay. There are some nice coconoe here in the United States. There's a nice coconoe in the display. At some point, that tree will fail. It's inevitable. Whenever we used to repot a coconoe, it was the most stressful thing ever because you could never, ever, ever put pressure on the trunk trying to pry it out of the pot. So we would cut all the soil around the edge of the pot, and then we'd have to lean it up on edge, and we'd have to use a wedge inside the pot, trying not to shatter the pot and not to apply pressure to the tree. It's terrible. But I've also seen several coconoe all of a sudden start to grow. Formal upright tree all of a sudden start to grow at some weird angle. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, you look at the graft, and the graft union was separating, and in two to three years, it was dead. Is this mm -hmm. true for grafting them on to just plain old goyamats also? No. They, they're plenty compatible there. Well, because, because normal white pine is not that vigorous. So normal, normal albino, right? Normal albino, they call them yatsubusa. Normal genetically um, altered cultivars are not nearly as strong as their original, the, the solid breed of plant. Okay? But Zuisho and Kokonoe are, ex are extremely stronger than the white pine. Somehow they got some freakish radiation. It's like Superman or the Incredible Hulk, right? Mm -hmm. They can grow faster, they thicken quicker, they bud back stronger. Radioactive spider bite. Right, no, spider bite. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There was some, some bug or boar or aphid that got into that that was sitting next to um, you know, radiation for a long time. And that's what happened. And so you have a tree that has the genetic ability capability to grow faster than the host plant that you've grafted it to can. Yes.
what means that, uh, what kind of wire do you use in your, um, in your own case? Okay. So the first question, how did I learn? I started out learning the first day. And my first day consisted of washing rags and cleaning toilets mm -hmm. and weeding along with tweezers. And I continued to learn the second day, which consisted of sweeping the floor, mm -hmm. washing his car, washing more rags, and weeding along with tweezers. And every day I continued to get better by sweeping the floor and washing the car and weeding along with tweezers. And if you went to Japan and expected to learn bonsai right away, you'd be fooling yourself. But at the same time, there was one of my older apprentices, uh, the, in fact the oldest apprentice of Mr. Kimura, his name is Yajima. He was with Mr. Kimura for 23 years, Yajima-san. And Yajima-san told me, everything is everything. Everything is everything. He said, the better that you get at sweeping the floor, the better you're going to be at bonsai. The better you get at washing that car, the better you're going to be at bonsai. The better that you get at weeding that lawn, the better you're going to be at bonsai. And I took that to heart. And so my education, everything I did there, even though bonsai was only 50% of the work of an apprentice while I was there, everything else that I did benefited me in the way that I approached and pursued bonsai. <clears throat> so how did I go about learning bonsai? I did everything that I could do there to the best of my ability, made it look as nice as it could possibly look. That became an ingrained thought in my mind. If I can do it better, I didn't do it good enough the first time. Right? Always striving for more. And what kind of wire do I use? I always use copper wire. I use copper wire on deciduous trees and I use copper wire on conifers, mainly because I don't want to fool with aluminum wire. But there are certain things that you have to do to adjust to using copper wire on deciduous trees. Why do we use copper wire? Holds the best. Holds the best, right? Holds the best. Annealed copper wire, very soft. As you apply it and work hardens, firms up, right? Mm -hmm. So the more you bend the branch with copper wire on it, the harder the wire gets the easier it is to hold the bend in that branch. Aluminum is not that way. It does not work hardened, or its work hardening is so insignificant that it, it would never make a difference in terms of its holding capability. Uh-oh. That's why I use copper wire. Oh, water? Water. Water. What kind of water do I use? I just use water out of the tap. I mean, I'm on well water now, because I live out in the boonies, but um, I use well water. We use tap water in Japan. Watering, I think watering is one of the vastly misunderstood things in bonsai outside of Japan. And that's not just in the United States, that's in the West, period. And watering is the hardest thing that you learn in bonsai, okay? If you can't water correctly, you can't do bonsai. That's not to say that you can't grow a bonsai. That's to say that you can't pursue bonsai at its highest level, right? Watering is what dictates health. So I think a lot of people think if they water their trees, they get a little bit of water on them, they're still alive, but they know how to water. That's, that's quite incorrect. Watering is significantly more complicated than that. Uh, Mr. Kamara always told me, I learned how to water for 11 years as an apprentice. I've been studying watering for 33 years as a bonsai professional, and I still don't understand how to water. Hmm? It's not easy. Watering is not easy. And if you take watering for granted, it'll come back and bite you. When you're watering your trees, do you, do you ever feel the soil? Um, I do from time to time on trees that uh, have health problems. I'll absolutely feel the soil to get a better idea of what's going on. However, the, import, the most important thing about watering is the fact that you'll never be closer to your tree than when you water. Right? You'll never be able to understand more about that tree than when you're watering. And so if there's a tree that's having problems and you have to identify a different solution to figuring out what's going on, then I'll put my hands on the soil. But otherwise, I know my trees very well. I can still call the person who's watering for me right now and tell them what trees at 12 o'clock are potentially dry. Because, because that's what I've had to do for the past six years in Japan and that's how I operate my nursery now. The condition yeah. of the, the condition of the working environment in terms of the workshop that we worked in, like what did the workshop look like? What's that? Anything you would like to share? 
anything that I'd like to show. The working environment was intense. You could cut through the arrow with a knife at any time. There was not much time. There was not. There were not many situations in which you sat there and you felt like you were really working at a relaxed pace on both sides. That wasn't the nature of the beast. And here's why: if 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 you're there to learn, and you're not being pushed past your comfort zone, you're not being asked or forced to grow. So Mr. Cameron never let us feel comfortable. Uh, complacency was not something that existed at his nursery. And so when we were in the workshop, it didn't matter if you were in your sixth year or your sixth month, you were being pushed with the same intensity. And that's why he has apprentices that out of all of his apprentices, every one that he's, he's given his graces to pursue bonsai professionally on their own is successful. Because they, we were pushed past our comfort zone every day. Bonsai now for me, even up here, uh, standing in front of you guys with the fear of making mistakes and all eyes on what I'm doing is so significantly less intense than what I experience there on a daily basis. This is very enjoyable for me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We used to sit there. We used to sit there. We always had to sit on our knees in Seiza, right? Sit on your knees, which almost crippled me. But, and I still do it to this day when I work. But sit in Seiza, and Mr. Kamura would give me a very a difficult tree and uh, he would give you that tree and you'd set it on your work work table and you'd start to look at it or something you know and, and uh, he would be sitting there watching you and he would be working and he would sit there and stare at you while he was wiring and he'd be pruning and staring at you <laughs> and you're sitting there trying not to look looking at the tree and trying to think clearly and you look over and he's sitting there staring at you <laughs> waiting for you to do something right and that never stopped. He could style an entire tree while he was watching me. He used to freak me out. <laughs> and I would be sweating. And he would look at me and he'd be like, what's wrong? You don't know what to do? <laughs> it's a bad idea. You don't want to do that. <laughs> I pick up my scissors to go to prune something. <laughs> Talk about pressures. Talk about intensity. I'll never forget one time I was sitting there wiring a tree with my back to the door. <laughs> wiring a tree with my back to the door and I just felt this hot breath on my neck. And I turned around and his head was right here and he has these glasses that magnify the size of his eyes. They look like Coke bottles, you know. And I turned around and these glasses are there staring and he's just breathing over my shoulder watching me work. He used to do stuff like that, but it was only, it was only to, to push us outside of our comfort zone. I thought, I thought that that was really brilliant of him. So when somebody asks, is he a good teacher? He's a phenomenal teacher. But he walks the line between driving you insane <laughs> and pushing you to be the best you can be every day. Absolutely walks the, walks the line. Very, very fine line that he walks. And a lot, of people, a lot of people can't hack it. That's why so many people came and went. Six years, 11 people. How do you treat your apprentices? How do I treat my apprentices? Um, Reads on their neck. <laughs> <there's>, <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a very big difference between the kind of um, wisdom and knowledge I have to offer my apprentices at 29 and the kind of wisdom and knowledge Mr. Kamara had to offer his apprentices at 70 years of age. And so when somebody comes to me to study, whereas um, the responsibility that he had towards us was to make us a man as much as make us a bonsai professional, um, I don't feel like I have the ability yet, the wisdom or the life experience to offer that same kind of experience. And so I don't try. I don't try to be who Mr. Kamur is. Um, I try to be who I am and teach my apprentices what they need to know to be successful at, at Bonsai in the manner in which they're going to pursue the endeavor. And so maybe in the future um, I'll take on the role of, of a more significant figure in their life. But um, you know, that's not to say that I'm not hard on my apprentices. I was the oldest apprentice at Mr. Kamura's nursery for four and a half of the six years that I was there. And that meant that I was teaching younger apprentices how to do bonsai all the time, continually teaching new people how to do bonsai. Um, that manner of conducting myself became ingrained in me. And sometimes that means you got to kick some ass, right? And so there are times when you have to be upset, and there are times when forcing students or forcing apprentices to understand the magnitude 
or the significance of the manner in which they're doing something or the manner in which they're not taking something serious is important in bonsai. You know, for him, we were working on multi-million dollar trees at some point, right? Hundreds of thousands of dollar trees. Uh, and if you weren't taking that seriously, if you didn't understand the, the magnitude, you didn't respect the fact that you were working on a tree that had been touched by six generations of Japanese bonsai artists, uh, you absolutely deserved everything that you got. And, and that needs to be driven home. Bonsai is not something that we have the right to pursue. Bonsai is something we have the privilege to pursue. And uh, I, was, I was happy that he conducted his education for me in that manner, and I try to, try to relay that same thought and feeling um, to my apprentices, absolutely. Did he ever accept women? Uh, he did accept women, actually. One of, one of um, my younger apprentices was female, and she lasted three years before she physically, her body started to um, deteriorate. And part of being an apprentice was not making excuses for anything. And so even though she was female, she didn't receive special treatment. Um, nor could she ha have received it and maintained the structure of the garden and the manner in which she educated us. So I don't think that that was any knock on his part. Um, I don't think that that was inappropriate by any means. Um, but it, it was the way things worked out. But he, he did. Uh, it, however, and this is not to be sexist, the world of apprentices is not friendly to females. It's not, absolutely not. Um, it's very, very phys physically demanding, not to say that females can't take that, but um, also mentally and emotionally demanding and taxing. Sounds like what surgeons used to say 20 years ago. Uh, I didn't say that women couldn't do it. No. I absolutely didn't say it, and in fact, I think that my experience with women who do bonsai is that they have a, a much greater sensitivity for the art. Uh, clearly they have a better eye for design than most men do. And I think naturally it comes much more natural to them to dedicate um, their attention and their affection to a tree. I think they take, tend to take it a bit more seriously. Uh, however, for an apprentice, in the world of apprentices in Japan, it was not a female friendly world. It was not. Um, it's an attentive position. So when you're sitting in Indian style or sitting on a chair and um, your posture's poor and you're shooting the bowl with your buddies, drinking a beer or something, right? That's completely different than the quality of work you can turn out if all of your focus is dedicated, mainly because of pain, towards uh, getting the work done quickly, efficiently, and in a manner that's appropriate, right? So it was strictly an attentive position that I found to generate a higher quality work for me. But if you're Japanese, isn't that a common sitting position? Seiza, so they, yeah, absolutely. They wouldn't necessarily be in pain. Doesn't mean it doesn't. It doesn't mean it feels good. <laughs> it doesn't feel good for anybody, right? Oh, and that's okay. That's another thing that you have to understand too. Just because, just because um, this natural um, idea of being an apprentice, just because it's a cultural art form does not mean, just because they sit in seiza normally, it doesn't mean that being an apprentice is easy for a Japanese person, it doesn't mean that sitting in seiza is easy for a Japanese person, it doesn't mean bonsai is easy for a Japanese person. But part of my job is teaching Japanese people, Japanese kids, how to be a Japanese apprentice. But I'm not Japanese, which means I had to work extra hard to get to the point where I could relay some of the ideas that were very foreign to me. But that also was a tremendous opportunity too. So. Is anyone doing in Japan to speak of what you're doing now, public demonstrations? Uh, public demonstrations are not a part of, they're typically not a part of Japanese bonsai. So Mr. Kimura does one demonstration per year, and that demonstration is at the exhibition that he set up for Zui Show, White Pines that nobody used to want to buy, and now a lot of people want to buy them. Right? I think he's an absolute genius for having done that. but. Um, public demonstrations are not an aspect of Japanese bonsai, right? They, they. I've heard that. I didn't know whether it's changed at all. It hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. Yeah. Ryan, you remember uh, when we were judging? We were saying um, that the tree always needs to be in the center of the pot. You were judging me. No, no, I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was very hard. But in the styles. 
Um, it, it, this particular one where you're saying it's kind of masculine, so we're bringing it back, have you know, lines going in different directions. So that's going to balance out the tree that will allow this to be in the middle of the pot. Uh, Any time that we create a tree, make no mistakes, the pot is not the place that you balance imbalance in a composition. Okay, the pot is not where that happens. So when we see trees off to the edge of a pot or something, and we say, well, the tree is leaning this way, so we need to move it to this direction in the pot. It's quite incorrect, right? The pot is an anchor. It's your attachment for the tree to the ground. That symbolizes the earth, right? We never, ever use that earth to offset imbalance. We do it all within the structure of the tree. So there have to be the characteristics in place for us to create something that has significant movement and drama. Right? We have to have firm rootage, a good base. We have to have the right movement. And then we utilize the branches to dictate that shape and rebalance that tree. If we have the correct elements and the branches are styled correctly to contradict the visual um, weight of the trunk and the intensity of the movement, okay, the pot is insignificant. The pot is insignificant. Okay? So like the hornbeam that cascades has a very heavy, heavy branch, right? Lacking root on that one side. If you don't reduce the visual mass of that branch, it's never going to feel stable because it doesn't have that characteristic that enables it to support that branch. Okay? okay? So we've always got to consider all of these things when we style a tree. Everything. Okay? Look at the front. You guys want to look at the front? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Brian? Yep. They live with me. They live with me. There's a big difference between a student and an apprentice. Mm -hmm. Big, big difference between a student and an apprentice. My apprentices live with me. Um, many of them, my first apprentice was from Slovenia, um, which is just outside of Italy. Uh, my second apprentice is coming from France. My first, third apprentice is coming from Guatemala. And my fourth apprentice is coming from Venezuela. Huh? So um, only just in the past month have I had an American say, hey, we want to apprentice with you. And it looks like I'm going to have an American apprentice from Ohio, but we'll see if that actually happens. But um, they've all approached me and said, we want to learn your style of bonsai. We find it to be very appealing. We want to know what you have to say. And uh, we're willing to do anything to gain that knowledge. And if they're uh, persistent enough and they want to learn badly enough, then um, I'll absolutely entertain sharing that knowledge with them. But to have somebody come for a week or a month train them and give them the tools that it took me six years to learn and that they can't possibly comprehend in that period of time and then say okay there you go you know take that home when they're not ready to utilize that knowledge they haven't reached a level of understanding competency maturity to do so uh, is counterproductive to what I'm trying to do in improving the level giving the people the ability to pursue bonsai with uh, a competency that I, I think is worthy of being considered somebody who can make a living doing it and so I just refuse to do it I need a, I need a, very much need a commitment from, from my apprentices. How long do you, are you intending on recommending leaving the wire on that on the side that was pretty flexible branches? So, right. So with ponderosa pines, these trees are designed to bounce back from being smashed by everything, right? Uh, trunks, branches, uh, snow, you name it. And they very rarely hold their shape after one wiring. But in order to, to compensate for that, I generally leave the wire on for two years. And until it's actually dug into the tree quite a bit. So it's dug into the branch. It's actually, the, we're, I'm actually generating wire scars. Okay? That tells me that I put on enough tissue that it can at least hold some of that shape. The second time I make sure to wire in a manner in which I'm not putting the wire back in those scars, so I'm not further damaging the tree, but I am reinstilling that shape and I'll do the same again. I'll let it grow until it starts to dig in a little bit and then I'll unwire it again. So generally two years. These aren't quick to, to have wire bite into them. Um, however, I just unwired a, a, a lodgepole pine, which is similar to um, a ponderosa pine in ways the, the, man, the areas in which they grow and the high alpine um, species of tree and in a year and four months it had uh, almost consumed the wire which I, I, have, I was not prepared for. So you, each tree is going to be different, very much so. Are there any other questions?
Okay, I've marked the front with two wires so that you guys can get a really clear idea of what I'm thinking with this tree. Thank you for uh, presenting me with the opportunity and for being a great audience.